Uh, good evening, both here at the RSA in London and online. Uh, we're here tonight to celebrate uh, both Hilary Cotton and her uh, fantastic new book, uh, Radical Help. My name's Gary Young. I'm a uh, journalist for The Guardian. And I will be uh, introducing Hilary, and then um, uh, we'll have a conversation for about uh, 20 minutes, half an hour, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, Jonathan Friedland described radical help as uh, possibly the most important book you might read this year. And in some sense, I feel that it is um, a summation of a body of work, a body of work for um, Hillary um, that kind of much of her career path in the way that she describes some of it in the book has been uh, leading up to it. She says right at the beginning as she pans out what this book is really about, our welfare state is not fit for purpose. It cannot support us in an emergency, it cannot enable us to live good lives, and it is at a loss when confronted with a range of modern challenges from loneliness to entrenched poverty, from a changing world of work to epidemics of obesity and depression. And then she spends uh, the next couple hundred pages not just telling, but showing with real life examples in a very, very readable way. Both this is the world that I would like to create and this is how I think we might go about creating it. And these are the problems that we may encounter in so doing. It's a very human book. Uh, it's also a very timely book. I can't think of a, a period in the last 15 or 20 years when it wasn't timely. Um, and um, I'm delighted to introduce Hillary to you, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the book. I'm assuming, given that it's only just coming out, that most of you haven't read it. Um, uh, tell you a little bit more uh, about the book before we start our conversation. So, ladies and gentlemen, Hilary Cotton. Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, too, for those of you, I don't know where you are, but those of you online and those of you in Cambridge this evening. Um, I wrote Radical Help because I want to have a different conversation about the welfare state. The left say that we should spend more money on our existing institutions, and the right say that people should just stand on their own feet and that if we had efficiency, everything would be fine. But I think that our troubles run much deeper and that also our possibilities are much wider. And I also think that we've lost sight of what really matters, of the bigger question, which was once at the heart of our welfare state, which was, how should we live? How should we flourish? How can we take care of everyone? And so that's what Radical Help is about. There are some seats at the front if anybody wants to kind of come to the front. Um, so I'm a social activist. I started out three decades ago in the barrios of Latin America and the compounds of southern Africa. And today I work in Britain. But what I've learned is that to make change, we have to step outside the institutions and we have to share time with people in their homes, in their communities, at work, doing everyday things and just listening. And this is my work. And I get to know people like Stan. He's a gentleman in his 90s. And he served in the war. He's a demon backgammon player. He's an Arsenal fan. And he lives actually quite close to here, in the heart of London, close to shops, libraries, cafes. But he's completely alone. Like over two million people in Britain today, he speaks to someone once a week. And when I asked Stan what would make the biggest difference in his life, what he said was that he'd really like to hear the music of his youth, the music he loves, a little Frank Sinatra, a little big band music, with people who also like the same music. So he needs a little help. I also get to know people like Ella. Ella lives on a rundown estate, and like lots of the mothers I work with, she has two mobile phones. One number she gives to the very small group of people she trusts, and the other she uses to keep what she calls the social at bay. 
And Ella and her family suffer from a whole range of complex troubles, a lack of work, debt, her children have been excluded from school. And by the time I met Ella, 73 professionals had been intervening in her life and the life of her family, but nothing had changed. And one of the reasons that Ella has two mobile phones is that she's absolutely terrified that the social will take her child away. And on the estate where she lives, most families know somebody that this has happened to, and Ella actually just hopes that the welfare state will walk away. I also spend time with the amazing people who work within our welfare systems, teachers, nurses, doctors, carers, social workers. These are professionals who are utterly committed, but often exhausted from trying to work within systems whose rules, boundaries and conditions are just unsuited for the challenges of today. And so this, I think, is the problem, which is that our once brilliant welfare state, which transformed lives, was designed for a very different era and a different economy and a very different set of problems. So in Radical Help, I argue that there are three reasons why our systems can't work any longer and can't be fixed. Firstly, we face a whole set of new problems, problems like loneliness, depression, chronic disease, the pressures of demographic change, immigration, living on a fragile planet. These problems weren't foreseen when our welfare state was invented. But I think what's important is not just that these problems are new, but that they're very different in nature, and so they need a very different response. If we take Stan's loneliness, the World Health Organization says that loneliness is a bigger killer today than a lifetime of smoking. But what could we do? We could appoint a minister, we could design a new service, but Stan doesn't want a service and he doesn't want to be befriended by somebody who just feels sorry for him. What he wants is to make friends, to reconnect with people that like him and like the things that he likes and they can do things together that they enjoy. So perhaps some of you think that loneliness is outside the remit of the welfare state, but we could think about the NHS, which in many ways is the jewel in the crown of the, of the welfare state. But it's also unsuited to modern demands. It was designed to cure infectious disease, but today one in four of us have a chronic condition. Obesity, diabetes, the complications of ageing, and none of these conditions can be cured. So with nowhere else to go, we end up in hospital. And 70% of British hospital expenditure goes on patients who shouldn't be there. So promising the NHS more money or more nurses or a new form of reorganization, as we're going to hear over the coming weeks, isn't going to help. We need a totally different system that can help us make and sustain life lifestyle changes, manage pain, and also to live well. And this is the common factor to all the challenges of this century, from loneliness to immigration, climate change to obesity. These aren't problems that can be solved by the command of a leader or a CEO, somebody at the top of the hierarchy, or they can't, they can't pass us a pill on a kind of efficient conveyor belt and hope that we'll be cured. Because the solutions to these problems require our participation, and they require these very strong horizontal bonds between us, within communities, between professionals, between all of us. And yet our welfare institutions are designed on these very vertical lines. They reflect the industrial era in which they were designed, which is very much kind of command and control from the top to the bottom. And they're designed to keep us at arm's length whilst they try to fix us, or more usually today refer us to somebody else. And there's a second major challenge, another reason why we can't fix the welfare state, I think, and that's because our social and economic structures are so different. The welfare state was designed around this idea of the white nuclear family and particularly on unpaid women's work. So there was this idea that the 1950s housewife would take care of the husband, the children, elderly parents, if necessary, the neighbours. And this world has gone and so we've got this crisis about who should care. Who should care for our very young children? Who should care for our uh, lovely parents, our growing elderly, elderly population? And we don't know. And what's worse, I think, is that we don't actually even have the words to talk about what matters. So we've got debates that are conducted by policymakers and our leading charities in the language of units. And the third, perhaps the most profound reason that our welfare state can't work is poverty. Poverty hasn't gone away. In fact, it's deepening. In 2016, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who'd been collecting poverty data for over 100 years, were forced to add a new category to their research, that of destitution. Because 1.25 million people today, including 300,000 children, are struggling to eat, keep warm, clean, and find a bed for the night. So it might feel like we've gone completely a full circle. But again, in this century, there are very important and critical differences. Because most people today who are poor are actually in work. 
Nearly half of all working families in Britain are supported by benefits, as the welfare state is forced to subsidise the private sector by topping up wages that are too low to live on. You're here this evening, you probably know, but only 1% of the welfare state budget goes to support unemployed people. That's predicted to be about 2.3 billion this year. 70 billion is going to go on in-work benefits. But no one wants to live on handouts. Everybody wants good work that's decently paid. So there's another form of poverty that's also strangling us, and that's the poverty of relationships. We don't know each other anymore. The digital economy is widening the economic gaps between us, those kind of earning the dizzying sums enabled by the algorithms of high finance and those on uh, minimum, often worsely paid work. Those people in, um, offering care, for example, that are living very precarious lives. And these gaps in income are reflected in chasms of geography. So the wealthy are concentrated in quite a few postcodes, or just a few postcodes, I should say. We don't live near each other. We don't go to school together. We don't join the same things. And this matters because there's a huge and growing body of research that shows that it's our relationships and who we know that, above all, predict our life chances. What kind of job we'll get, what kind of health we'll have, and who will take care of us in the end. So modern poverty is about a lack of money, but it's also about a rent in our relationships. And our welfare state doesn't have any answers. So what can we do? I propose six shifts. And these shifts are all closely connected to each other. Everyone counts. The first shift is conceptual. I think we need a vision. We, uh, and this, I don't mean a management target, which is what we have, of how we can deliver things better, but a very big shared national vision of how we want to live. The second shift has to make this reality rather than an empty promise. We have to leave behind the services that manage our needs and create new systems of support that can grow the capabilities that we need to flourish. Today, it's astonishing, but 80% of the resource available in our systems is spent on the system itself, assessing people, referring people, managing the queue. And this is entirely unproductive. We have to instead invest in change. And this framework isn't a theory. It was developed through practice, and we can use it to bring about practical change. With colleagues, many of whom are here tonight, I can see you, which is so nice, and communities across Britain, I've spent the last decade doing just that. And Radical Help tells the story about how this framework can change the lives of the young, the old, those who are unwell, and those who need good work. So let me give you just one example. Systems to support employment were right at the heart of the original design of the welfare state. And I think that anyone or any, any of us who are going to rethink it have to propose something new here. We're going through an industrial revolution based on the possibilities of hyperconnectivity, artificial intelligence, biotech. And facing this, facing this challenge is a system of support and, which offers benefits and advice that was designed in the 1950s. So, of course, there's been a rebranding and a constant recalibrating of benefits. But in essence, if you were a 1950s time traveller and you rocked up at the job centre or the welfare to work service, you would know exactly what to do. And given the changes in the work and the world around us, I think it's perhaps not surprising that these services have a 66% failure rate and they cost millions to run. When I spend time in the job centre, I meet people who are going around for the second, the third, sometimes the 15th time. So with my colleagues, we tried an experiment. We put up this false door in the job centre and we emblazoned it with this huge slogan that said, get me out of here. And we said to anybody who wanted to come through this door that they could give us five pounds and come through. And actually, so many people wanted to come through that we had to kind of keep raising the price by the hour. Because everybody in the job centre wants to escape the stigma, the shame, and they're desperate to try another approach. They know that standing in this queue is not going to create change in their lives. And they're right. Because eight out of ten jobs in Britain today aren't advertised. I mean, probably if all of you here think for a moment about how you got your last job, it's probably somebody you know who connected you, who told the headhunter to call you, I don't know if you've got an important job, or if, even if you saw the adverts, probably somebody you know told you to send the advert to you. So in fact, the very worst way to find work is the way that our employment services enforce. They make you stand in a queue with somebody else just like you, and they make you fill out forms online for the very small number of jobs that actually are advertised in order to qualify for your benefits. So we didn't ask those who came through the door what qualifications they had or how long they'd been out of work. We said to them, what do you want to do? What's your dream? And what do you think would be the next step on the line to get there? 
And the service we designed, called Backer, included people who were in work and people who were out of work, and people in between. Because today, progressing from a badly paid entry-level job is harder, actually, than finding a job. And we held meetings in public places, and we de developed these simple tools, and said to people, what do you need to do to take the first step? Who do you need to know, and how can we connect you? And some bits of this worked at first, and some didn't, and we kind of kept iteratively improving. Because we start very small, we tinker, and I think it's really important that how we work really, really matters. If we want to create different things, then we are going to have to work in a completely different way. And above all, what we have to do, as I said, is foster capability. So we focused in our work on this, uh, always on four capabilities, work and learning, by which I mean the ability to inquire. I don't just mean kind of getting some, you know, certificates. Um, health, inner, inner health and uh, physical health, being part of a community and relationships. And the capability approach developed by, uh, originally by the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen and then developed with the philosopher Martha Nussbaum, um, asks this apparently very simple question, which is, what can you really be and do? So, you know, Stan lives, as I said, not far from here in the heart of London, but he's completely alone. Ella and her family actually live right next door to a Honda car family, but a car, for car family, it is like a family car factory. But right now, Ella really doesn't have, or when we met her, didn't really have any chance of getting a, a job in that factory. So it isn't enough to talk about what opportunities there are around us. We have to understand internal worlds, and we have to understand structural realities, and we need to work from both ends at once. And this simple question, what can you really be and do, shifts the power. So capabilities can't be done to you. I can't do you a relationship any more than I can offer you health like a kind of efficient parcel. And everyone we work with sees the difference. So professionals who will at last be able to use their skills, and also those who are locked like Ella, just revolving in the system. We ask Ella and families like hers to design their own way out, and with support, change happens. A PricewaterhouseCoopers evaluation of BACA, the employment work, showed that 87% of our members progressed, 100% built capability, and the cost was one-fifth of standard approaches. The same principles applied to health made the same difference. We sat in doctor surgeries, and we asked everyone stuck in the system, in pain, on drugs that don't work, if they'd like to try a new approach. We provide the support and the relationships to sustain lifestyle changes, and the results really impressed the clinicians we're working with. Young people starting out, older people needing care. In every case, we applied our framework, fostering capabilities and above all relationships with dramatic results. This is an approach that's affordable and does take care of everyone. So how can we transition? The third part of Radical Help is dedicated to this question. How can we move from where we are now to where we need to be? I don't have all the answers. I think we're going to have to create this together. But I do suggest some ways forward. We have to start with what's abundant, because it's not just that our problems have changed since the welfare state was designed, our resources have as well. In every case, the experiments I describe in the book were made possible by technology. We didn't use technology to prop up existing services or make them more efficient, as generally is happening around us. We used it to invert business models and ensure we could connect people together. So cheap available CRM platforms, the type of customer database most businesses use, enables us to design a service for older people that could provide practical on-demand support. We connected what was already there in the community, and unplanned hospital admissions fell, uh, as did unnecessary GP visits, by 25%. And most importantly, a sense of capability and flourishing grew, all at low cost and all by designing in relationships. And this is the other thing we have in abundance, us. We're many, we're talented, we're creative, and when systems are designed to make it easy to join, we do want to join in. Everything I design includes as many people as possible, which completely turns the existing logic of the welfare state on its head. Because the more people we are, the more relationships, the more people to care, to connect with, to enjoy things with. I think perhaps the most important thing is that the work I'm describing isn't in fact radical. It's all around us. In fact, I'm sure many of you here today are doing exactly the same kind of work, but it's marginal. This isn't the kind of work that funders like to support. It looks messy. It doesn't fit in the existing measurement systems. And it's about instincts, not rules. But the fact is, we could make change fast by investing in what's already here, in growing these fragile and nascent models that at the moment are too often surviving in spite of the system, by moving this work from the margin to the centre. 
When William Beveridge wrote his famous report, The Blueprint for Our Welfare State, he didn't invent anything or everything from scratch. He did invent some things, but he created a new framework and set it out very clearly what would be valued in the future. Some people, like teachers, were excited. Others, like doctors, kind of came very unwillingly. But everything was folded into this framework, and the results for the British public were transformative. So we can do it, because we've done it before. This is a time for revolution, not for patching, Beveridge said. It was very audacious. He was standing there in the midst of a war-ruined country that had come out of not only war, but depression. And it's the same today. So let's stop patching and reinvent the vision for our times. And let's start conversations about what we can create here and now. And I think this would be radical help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hilary. Well done. <laughs> um, Thank you, Gary. I want to I start with um, something that you said early on when you talked about the amount of benefits that are paid to people who are in work. Um, in the book, at different times, we, we see people working two jobs and therefore they're kind of relationships with their families aren't quite what they might be and so on. And so I just wonder the degree to which it's the welfare state that needs patching as opposed to late stage capitalism, which is um, pauperizing our lives, um, robbing us of time, paying us too little, and that therefore the help that we might be giving is actually to prop up that system as opposed to to challenge it. So I think, is that working now? Is that okay? Yeah. So I think this is a really important and fundamental question. And um, yes, I think that a very big proportion of welfare is actually a category mistake. It, you know, that we've pushed everything that should be economic into the social arena and we need to have a rebalancing. And I think that there's some really exciting economic work at the moment that is kind of is, is trying to do that. I think that's really important. Um, but I think that we are in this moment of kind of technical transition and any historical moment like that needs very precise social systems that help that transition work and don't leave people behind. And so one of the reasons I think it's also really important to think about it economically is not just because of the category mistakes, but also because I think what's happened, which is, you know, late capitalism, is that all these problems that are around us have been presented as problems of individuals, you know, oh, you're that feckless family, or you're that kid that can't keep up at school, or, you know, you're that single unemployed person. But if we actually kind of situate this within economic transition, we can see that it's not about the individual, it's about how, as a society, we kind of navigate these big flows. And then when we think about it like that, which is what we've tried to do in our work, uh, you know, then you see very different solutions come forward. Do you find some people do get stuck on the resource question. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a bit where you talk about David Cameron's big society and you said lots of people scoffed, but we thought it was interesting. And I was a scoffer, so I thought, well, you're about to embark on a massive um, thing of austerity. So where's this big society gonna come from? What would, you know, what, it won't be in our libraries because they'll be closed, you know, and so on. Um, so I'm wondering the degree to which when you try and have these conversations, where do you find they get stuck? Yeah, so, well, you're much wiser than me on the big society, obviously, I was just, <laughs> you saw it coming. Well, no, that's, um, it's the difference between being hopeful and being cynical, yeah. but, but, but uh, there's, a, there's a, a broader point there, yes. which is kind of, um, uh, there are certain moments at which I will go yeah, yeah. because, um, um, because I, I want there to be more money for things. Well, I think, you know, it's good that you talk about resource. So a rule in the work is we can't talk about money. We can't talk about money till quite a long way. I mean, when we do the innovation projects, they take about nine months, and we can't talk about money for quite a long time because as soon as you mention money, 
the conversation absolutely narrows and it becomes about who should get what. We can see this, I mean, you know, it, with the discussion we had last week, was it, where, you know, nationally we were talking about, oh, older people have too much, they've got to give it to younger people. It just constantly goes back to this sort of like, well, who's going to get the spoils? So I think the most important thing, if you want to create something new, is to kind of leave the money question to the end, which is what we, it's hard work, persuade everybody to do. Um, and then generally we find there are resources. But I think the other thing that's really important in the work is, there's a couple of things. I mean, first of all, that we combine different resources. So at the moment we have this sort of jam jar economy where there's public money, private money, people's time. But like the aging work works because we combine all of that on the same platform. Um, but the other thing I think is really important is that we do need money to change the system. So there's also a story in the book about Wigan where they've kind of done fundamental systemic work. But what the leader of Wigan says is if we hadn't started this before austerity, if we hadn't already developed those models, there's no way now that we would be able to shift the system. So it's a kind of balanced picture. But certainly there's lots of money locked up at the moment in the system that we could use in a very different way. There's a really quite moving moment, I think, in, um, uh, near the beginning in family life where you're talking about Ella's uh, family and you get together all the people who've been working with her family and you have this intervention wall chart and you write down all of the ways in which people have intervened and in the end there's no wall left because there's been so many interventions and you write we step back. Nearly 20 years of interventions of long hours, exhaustion, worry, and well-meant activity snake around the walls. There was stunned silence. More than one of those present wept, broken by the futility represented on the walls. Each person in the room had focused on their job, doing their very best, either unaware of the scale of the problem or tuning it out. Can you just, just talk us through that moment and kind of what it says more broadly about the people who are the practitioners in, on the kind of front line. So I think it's really interesting. This is really a story about seeing is believing because when the team started to do this work, Gordon Brown had been talking at that time about, you know, how there were these, I can't remember, what, did he call them chaotic or troubled families? I can't remember, and that how much money they cost. And he'd worked out where all the money went. And so when the team, it was not my idea, had this idea that this is what they were going to do, I was like, oh, but Gordon Brown's done that. Why is that going to be kind of like so powerful? But it was so powerful because we were talking about a family that everybody knew and 30 years of interventions, which as you say, built and became dizzy as the children became older and when everybody involved could see their work in the bigger picture that was the moment of breakdown but also opening but you know over the years if I tell this story to friends who don't work um, in in public service they're, they're sometimes surprised perhaps it sounds kind of a bit odd but I think unless you actually work in these kind of really really difficult systems you cannot imagine the stress if you have to work in situations of high risk, if the queue's really long, your caseload is really high, money is being taken out of the system, all you can do is just kind of focus narrowly in front of you and not think of the bigger picture. So I think a really important, I mean, I think that you've picked two things, two really important themes to me in the book. One is, that we can't have a conversation which pits professionals against the public. Like, good people can't work in bad systems. There's no good talking about what we want and thinking people can deliver it in the same systems. We have to kind of look after professionals. And but, a lot of the conversations yeah. do end up like that, don't they? Do they? <laughs> well, I feel like... not, well, not Looking in, after professionals. Not in your book, but that generally... Oh, yes. The, well, we've the, had the, this, the professionals, we've had... it's teachers against parents, or yeah. it's social workers against communities, or... And, and, you know, I came to a talk here where Nick Timmins, who's the biographer of the welfare state, said that, you know, one of the things that Tony Blair did was he split the conversation. He changed the language. He said, welfare state is from now on going to be used just to you know, uh, be people on benefits, bad. We're going to use the language of public service for all those wonderful middle class people, good. And from that moment, the, there used to be hundreds of reports published every year about wealth, the welfare state, one hasn't been published since. And that was also the moment where it was kind of the user versus the professional, which... Mm. But the other thing you're talking about, I think, is what methods can we use? What practice can we have where we can begin to kind of see things that have been around a long time in a different way, which gives us that opening to kind of really make change? Um, there were times, and you refer to it in your talk a bit, when Beveridge brought out his report, there were some people like teachers who were very open, there were others like doctors who took more convincing. There are moments here where the practitioners 
struggle to kind of, um, I guess, give up their their autonomy or give up their power or, um, uh, or struggle with the systems that you're creating? Yeah. What, what does that look like? Well, I mean, if you think about the person who let us put up a door in the job centre, I mean, he's nothing short of a saint, is he? Because, like, <laughs> the, the thing is, is that in the current system, nothing will happen to you if you just manage stuff as usual. You can just carry on. But if you try to make change and it doesn't work, then, you know, every, it, the media will complain, the general public will complain, politicians will come down on you. So it's very, very difficult. So, first of all, I completely understand why people don't want to make change. What it looks like when people resist, well, I kind of describe the three different ways that it can look like in the book. Um, I mean, I think one of the things we really need to talk about openly is that when we do try to make change, what so often happens is that people borrow the language and they don't make any change at all. So, I mean, I talk, you know, people come to me now, I've used relational welfare, and they say, oh, you know, I'm doing this relational service. I'm like, well, that's interesting. What, what exactly is that? Like, has something changed in the interaction? Or have you, you know, is this just another word that we're going to use for what we, you know, like personalization? So I think uh, resistance usually doesn't look avert. It looks like this kind of very slippery use of language to kind of keep doing the same thing. Which is why this has to be public, because the public know, mm. we know whether it's the same thing or whether it's actually changed, because we feel that in the interactions. There is a very interesting bit with um, Ella's uh, folks where they are interviewing prospective people who are going to work with them yes. and they're asking people well what would you do in this situation and somebody says you know well I would run away and refer it to somebody else and somebody says you are the fucking system you you know um, um, and yeah you got a sense that that wasn't going to work with that particular person <laughs> um, so I want to uh, move on to last question and you mentioned this towards the end about transition yes. and how so the book really takes four experiments in some detail the uh, one with the tr troubled families um, the um, uh, health work and youth and aging five are there actually five yeah. okay sorry I thought Okay, I thought that I, I just elided the health and the aging. Well, I tried to go cradle to grave because obviously that's what beverage ah, did really. Go. And also because I don't want to go service by service. I want to go through the life right. cycle. Um, and, um, and they're like guerrilla interventions, aren't they? Into kind of, you know, you've, you've, you've got your door in the... Um, uh, in the unemployment office, or this, you know, this one thing in Swindon that it, you, you're piloting, um, and you say you often get asked, "Yeah, okay, fine, so Swindon, I'll give you Swindon," but can you, you know, will it will it play in Peoria kind of thing? How do you um, do it to scale? And you say, it, "So long as you're thinking about doing it to scale, you're thinking in the wrong way." Um, uh, you're thinking of kind of maximizing it in an industrial sense. So how should we think about these experiments when they work and when they don't work? How can we understand their application? Because the welfare state was a, it was a national system and that may be part of what's wrong with it, in a sense, that it's one size fits all wherever you are. Um, but you're suggesting something quite different or at least the expansion of these ideas would happen in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I don't have the answers, obviously. Um, but, I, but you have a vision. I have a vision, yes, which I hope then we can all kind of make into an answer, this evening even. But um, I, I do believe in a national system. I mean, I do believe in a national framework. I think it's not okay to think, oh, well, I'm very lucky I live in Peckham, I've got this care, but oh, you in Doncaster, sorry. You know, I mean, I think it's got to be... Uh, there's got to be a national framework. But what I, what I believe is that the role of the modern state should be to kind of set that framework, to talk about, not in terms of like we must have these targets, but to talk about that vision, to tell stories of what that looks and feels like. And then locally we need to kind of grow the responses. And I think that technology is the big kind of 
shift here because what's possible like with the circles the aging um, example that we took to other parts of the country or even actually the family program which went to four parts of the country some successfully and some not um, what, what matters is that if you have got a kind of technology system, you can link to something much bigger. We see this in kind of cooperative movements. We see this in kind of other things. Um, the radical economist Julie Richardson describes it like mycelium, you know, the kind of mushrooming that the kind of, you can't see the underneath. It's very, very thick. And then the kind of mushrooms sprout up everywhere that are all part of this very solid body underneath. So that's what I think. I mean, that's why I propose the framework, the capabilities, because I think with this architecture, you can take that and you can kind of create it and push it forward. You know, it's not like that this is the static place that we've got to there's a lot more work to do does that begin to yes yeah yeah um i'm about to throw it out to the audience before i do i know hillary that you there are some people you want to thank uh, that you didn't do all of this on your own um uh and there's some people who you know made community with you while you were doing this that you want to uh, so why don't we do that well i think you know there's that thing that it takes a community to raise a child and you've written amazing books gary you know it <laughs> takes like 50 communities to write a book doesn't it <laughs> so i do want to say that um that, uh, that this really is a kind of communal effort that um, many of you who made the work are are in the room and i've borrowed some of your stories i hope you don't mind the retelling but this work is about a collaboration um, my amazing editor and publisher, Lenny Goodings, is in the room, and I was so lucky to be with Virago and to be with Lenny. Thank you. Susan is here, who's made all of this happen. I hope that my agent, George Capel, is here somewhere. Are you here? Hi, George. Who kind of, from the very beginning, with this mad idea, you just totally believed in it and got behind it, and I really can't thank you enough. And then um, there are kind of all my friends, because writing a book is like totally a traumatic experience who kind of propped me up when I fell over, my family who had to live with it. Um, so, so for me, one of the kind of best things about being here this evening is I did want to really be able to say a heartfelt thank you to you all. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. So we have about uh, 20 minutes uh, for questions. Um, because we've got the mics, I'm not sure if there are still roving mics, maybe we've got them all. All oh, right, now there are a couple. Um, so if you put up your hand, we'll take two or three questions uh, or contributions, if they're contributions, if you can keep them fairly brief um, at a time. Um, um, the, uh, the woman here and the woman next to her. Yeah, you too. Hello. Uh, is this on? name and rank. Hi. Hello. My name's Emily. I am a social policy researcher and project manager. Um, my question is about accountability mechanisms. Um, I lived through the very interesting times of the Flexible New Deal and the work program and the welfare reform era of well, about 10 years ago now and have moved through the social policy space, you know, through evaluations, frameworks our objectives, outcomes, etc. And I've done a lot of work with service users, most of whom I'm probably like the 95th researcher that they've spoken to, um, you know, the 12th person who's interested in their life. Um, but we are talking about public money. And even if we take a co, you know, a co design, a personalized, a sort of a, a, a coaching model, a relational model, we still have to say that we use the money in the right way. So how do you square the circle of using the money in the right way and proving it without ending up with, you know, the, the, uh, the huge iceberg that is, uh, that underpins the, uh, of the huge iceberg of accountability, consultancies, frameworks, etc., that underpins the very small bit above the surface that is the person. Thank you, uh, yes. It's on a similar and related note, really. Uh, my name's Carol, I'm an academic in education. And I was just thinking about the abuse it could be open to. Um, we've got the historical legacy of cronyism and old boy networks that have really perpetuated the social inequalities that we see around us. And it's worked well for some people. And it sounds like what we're doing is creating an altruistic model at the other end of the scale for people who don't have anything or they're really struggling, which sounds good on paper, but then 
the inequalities can open up again and how do we make that fair? Um, and one, one more. Yes. Hi, Hilary. Rowena, nice to Hi. see you. Thank you uh, fantastic talk. I just wanted to ask, when you did get to try out your models, when they were working relationally, genuinely, what were still the biggest obstacles for, for people uh, in terms of changing their lives around? And then secondly, if I can be really cheeky, are there any implications of your book for services outside of welfare, for example, in education, being a teacher? Do you think this has ramifications for other areas? Okay. Three, three easy ones. Okay, there for you. okay. So the first thing I would say is that the whole service user thing. I mean, look, what normally happens is that we say that we're engaging with users and you're the 85th person in the queue and actually what you're doing is you're going out with your, your I'm not talking about you, Emily, but just generally what's happening is that People are going out and they're saying, how can I fix this service? Look, I'm with X service and it's not working very well. I want your opinion how to fix this service. What they're not doing is just spending time listening and seeing how people's lives are. And then what, what would we actually design to support that, which is a completely different inversion. And in fact, one of the hardest things we have in the beginning of the work is actually to kind of somehow kind of explain that because everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, we're trying to do something completely different. And both of you are asking a question about transparency and um, it it's not look it's not that I don't think those things are serious but also partly it's like at, at the macro level it's a bit like at the family level when we said why don't we let the families you know find their own way through this because frankly nothing could be worse than the kind of quarter of a million you're spending every year and the 73 people that aren't making any change and I'm afraid I kind of think that about the welfare state it's like well, we're wasting so much money. People who really need support are receiving so little support. What's the risk, really? And, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago when I started this work, people would talk about postcode lottery, you know, like there would be this assumption, which fortunately has gone, that somehow everybody in this existing system has the same service. And what would happen with what I'm proposing? Because people would get different things. As if, like, you know, where I live in Peckham, you can't see a GP, but in, you know, Hampstead, maybe you can. I mean, this is already here. It's not like everybody is getting the same thing. So what we need to do is think about where we start. So one of the things we do with our work is we say, okay, we're going to work in Southwark. Let's start in the place of Southwark that has got the greatest need and kind of go there out so that we're thinking about these things from the beginning. But I don't think we can... We can I don't think it's a kind of either or. I just think we have to take it very seriously. I mean, there's a very big question which I can't really answer now about the relationship, which I'm anxious about, the question that you ask, because I think uh, we had bureaucracies because we didn't trust cronyism. The bureaucracies, as we can now see in every walk of life, reinforce cronyism. I'm suggesting something very different, which is very open and participative, which is one way of controlling that. But of course, it can also have its own problems, which is a kind of bigger discussion. Um, the question about obstacles. I mean, you know, one of the obstacles is actually if you have to be very small and you can't go fast enough. So, for instance, with the, the live programs, the family programs, I mean, Gary talked about how we interviewed people to join our team. So immediately that sets up a kind of thing of like, well, you're great, you can come into our team, but sorry, everybody else is on the outside. There's a kind of you know, implication that you might not be such a great social worker as the person on the inside. If you can go fast enough and change the systems like we're going to doing and include everybody, you actually have a lot less obstacles. So I think that's really important. I mean, on the education thing, there's nothing on schools directly. Uh, but, of course, education is the thing. I mean, the first thing would be, oh, it's gone, the fourth capability. Like, the, what, what on earth are we going to do in schools to kind of actually make them places of learning again rather than kind of factories? I've got no, well, I've got some ideas, but uh, that, that, that isn't in the book, but that would be, you know, the kind of place, you know, the capability framework has a lot to say about how our schools would be structured and, you know, how teachers would be kind of given again the power to kind of be professionals. I mean, I use the example of how teachers are controlled. You know, you can't be trusted to mark your own exams and so on. You know, I mean, that all has to change again, really. Um, another three. I'm going to take the gentleman at the back there. Um, the woman here and the man here. Uh, thank you. My question is about how you take it from the margin to the center. Uh, my name is Mark Bittell. I was turned into being a recovery activist after working in the Scottish government uh, in the drugs policy unit. So we've actually set up 
uh, an independent organization called Independence from Drugs and Alcohol Scotland uh, to set up a prototype project which is being uh, which has started up in Scotland but the question really is about how you take things from the margin to the center the forces that we're up against are big pharma you know there's a lot of money in big pharma everybody that wants we've had a hundred we've been open for three months we've had hundred and forty people request uh, the first ten places that we've got this year and everybody that come that tries to come is on such enormous over medication you know beyond methadone and suboxone uh, that it's really really hard to help them with our radical help uh, so that's just an example but how do you get from the margins to the center when you're up against really big forces, really big forces of capitalism who are making lots and lots of money out of our misery and poverty industries. Um, so next is uh, the woman here with her hand up. Yep. Oh, yep. Yeah. No, well, never mind. Hi, um, my name is Liz Sewell. I run probably the smallest project on the Troubled Families program, which is a women-only project, and we work in children's centres and schools. And we run in groups because I think that groups are empowering, and we only do one-to-ones if people want one-to-ones, and, and, and they do after a while. I think the most radical thing that happened in the last 20 years was children's centres. And I think that children's centres are the way that you can move things from the local to the mainstream and you can look at national policies. And I think that children's centres, which are mainly, uh, I, I, you know, men do amazing things, but mainly run by women and for women and supported women were just um, a really radical way of, of supporting people. And the, the more I work, the more I think you have to start as early as you can to support people. And I would say two things that, that children's centres did that, um, that aren't... Sort of, I, People don't smack their children in public anymore. They, they don't, because, and that's, I think that's the, the basis of children's centres, because people learnt that there were other ways of doing it. And if you look at the studies, more people read to their children, and we know that's one of the best things that you can do. So I, I think that there are, there are sort of big things that you can do, investing in local communities, and then let those lo local communities support each other. Um, and then there was the, uh, the man here. Thanks. So, Hilary, <laughs> if, if you were given, say, 50 saucy. or 100 million um, pounds set up a foundation to, to make it, because you, you've been in this game for a while, you know, you've got, a, you've got as much experience as anyone, what should this foundation do? If, you, if you're going to set up the Radical Help Foundation, with a decent endowment, there might be someone watching who's, you know, got that kind of cash available, who knows? <laughs> you never know, but, 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 yeah, but what, really, what should it do? Okay. okay. Big and tough questions. Um, so on the kind of big pharma uh, question and the margin to center, I mean, obviously, look, I, I don't have the solution to big pharma. I would have the 100 million if I had that, that solution. But what I do feel very, very strongly, and this kind of, in a way, goes to Gary's first question, is that because we don't have a national conversation, these things are not part of the picture. So there's an, you know, we've got sort of, I mean, Robin Murray, the kind of economist to whom my book is dedicated, had an idea of four sectors of society. You know, we've got business, we've got communities, we've got private households, and we've got the state. And we've sort of pushed everything that's welfare into private homes, which goes to your children's center point, and into the state. But actually, the other two quadrants have got to kind of come in any kind of new social settlement for the 21st century has to include those players. And they have to be brought into the conversation. And part of the work that I'm doing with this book is kind of meeting those people. Now, you know, that's just the beginning, and I'm sure you've met with them too, and probably not, you know, had, but until those issues are no longer kind of your issues with your, you know, 100 people trying to do, you're, they're not going to be resolved. So we have to find a way to kind of widen the conversation to bring that in, I think. The children's center point, I mean, I suppose, you know, obviously I think it's kind of tragic that children's centres are being closed on one level, but I also think just like any service, it depends who's running it, how, you know, I've seen children's centres and children's centres, how embedded they are in the neighbourhood. Not one single one of the families that I have worked with in the four different places um, of the LIFE programme would ever dare take their children to a children's centre. They think that those are places that are not for me. So I think 
like all these things, you know, it's, it's complicated. It depends how well it's embedded in the community. It can be brilliant, especially if it's got good outreach. I'm sure you've had all of that experience. Um, but it can also be another box ticking exercise. So, uh, so it, it, again, it's not kind of, it, it's, there's experience in there, which is the solution. Yes, definitely. And then the hundred million. Ha. Huh. Um, the thing is that what we need to do is we need to kind of seed this work and we need to do it in a way that takes, I think, I mean, I've proposed a framework that if we make those six shifts and we follow these four capabilities, change will happen. It's a proposition. Like if tonight people say, well, we need six capabilities or you've got to add this or take that out, that's the conversation. But I actually think if we take this and we empower people to do it, and also we, we empower people with the methods to do it, because one of the really important things is about working differently. You can't sort of expect to get this, as I keep trying to say, through, through sort of traditional methods of working, that we would have a lot of practice, because what we need is a lot of stories about things that are working, rather than what happens at the moment, which is they're very small, you kind of get patted on the head, but you're not, you're not part of, of, of a bigger framework. I think that would be really, really important, and also in that, foundation would be the four quadrants because it can't just be people who are kind of already committed and doing doing good work uh, so i have time for two more questions i'm going to give those to the two people who i originally pointed to but then <laughs> the microphone went wondering so yes um the lady there um and then the chat there thank you very thank you my name is mabel van oranje and i was wondering um, what can we do both to help to, um, to get the book out and also to uh, realize your dreams of a revolutionized welfare state? Thank you. I, I'm Rashid. I, I run a small charity in Camden called The Winch. Um, and we also have a library. Um, and um, we, we were founded when um, the community squatted a disused pub, the Winchester Arms, and took it over and turned it to a community use. I was interested in, I haven't read your book yet, so apologies. It's only been out a day, I'll get to it. Um, Thank so you. apologies for asking out of ignorance, but I, was, I noted that when you talked about the new problems that we're facing, you said one of the problems we were facing is immigration. And I was interested in what's going on for you when you frame immigration as a problem, um, and how you think a radical help approach deals with the problem of immigration as you see it. Okay, so I'm going to start there and go to, the, to what we can all do afterwards. Um, so I think that immigration is framed as a national problem. I'm not saying that I see it, but I think you know, we can see that in Brexit and everything else, that we've got this, uh, this sort of panic about what's going to happen. Um, you know, I'm a historian. I'm really interested that you know, when Beveridge wrote, wrote his report, there was a kind of national panic about all these people coming from rural areas and taking over urban jobs. I mean, like, the, you know, it's like it goes round and round the same kind of conversation. I do think that there's something very different about living in a fantastic kind of uh, multiple society um, where we are kind of, we have to kind of create a different kind of social settlement because we can't be assumed to kind of all come from the same heritage. And that, that we ha that's why we have to kind of tell different stories and kind of, but, but I, it's, it, are you saying, how would I solve it within the framework? You're just saying, no, that I framed it as a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess because what I think is, I think it's a big social, it is definitely a big social challenge. I, I see uh, the most interesting discussions about immigration happening in, in fiction rather than in, in non-fiction at the moment, because I think, you know, uh, given climate change and other things, we're at the cusp of a kind of huge historical moment of, of migration. And, you know, we're, we're kind of still trying to kind of keep out, you know, a thousand people or whatever. So we're only at the beginning. And what I'm saying is that I think that this is also a kind of big challenge of our time, which is not going to be solved by diktat. It's going to be solved by us talking about it and thinking collaboratively, participating, building relationships and thinking of a different way forward. That, that's that's my, my point, really. To the point about what we can do, uh, the book ends with an invitation, actually, for, for people to kind of uh, to do. I think the most important thing is actually doing, creating, making. But I think in the short term, uh, one of the reasons, one of the most important reasons I wrote the book is because I think that so often what we do is we wait for some great leader who's going to deliver the kind of next thing. And we can see that at the moment, even if we had the most amazing political leaders, 
that there isn't a national story that they could act on. There's no kind of national vision of where we're going to go. And in that situation, it's very, very hard, even if you get to lead, to actually make change. So what I would like is that everybody here this evening <laughs> buys a book, of course, buys more than one book, gives the book to somebody, and actually has a conversation with somebody who is not like them and perhaps doesn't believe as they do, um, and begins to talk about kind of the issues and how we can kind of create a way forward with these issues. For me, that would be kind of step number one. Step number two would be then to think about how we can begin actually to kind of fund and grow and nurture this work and to, to talk about some of the things, quite honestly, that are, are holding these approaches back, why this work does at the moment happen in spite of kind of dominant systems. So um, that's all we have time for. Uh, I want to thank you here, the yes, RSA. Can I say one thing about that? London? Can I also say just one thing which I What's think that, that the most important community, which is, is people here having a debate and having a conversation, because obviously a book needs readers and a debate needs hundreds and thousands of people to, to have that conversation. So thank you very, very much for giving up an evening and coming. I really appreciate it. Um, well, um, I think it barely needs repeating, but there are books outside. <laughs> Uh, if you would like, uh, if you would like to buy one, Ten I want person. to, um, or, or more than one, I would. Um, uh, I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank you, both here in London and online, and of course, uh, to thank Hilary both for her book and her talk and her insights. So put your hands together for Hilary. Thank you. happens, Britain is going to be divided. This does not mean that the United Kingdom will be in any way less united. The impact of 2016 on the nation's psyche appears stark. This country is more divided than ever. We're not going to heal some of these divisions. Racist populism is out of the bottle. Can we salvage a functional nation out of two groups who increasingly despise each other? Lifetime, I've never seen this country divided like this. This is astounding to me. But you're deliberately seeking out opinions that reinforce your views? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Polarisation is the buzzword of the moment. Over the past two years, if you've turned on the news, the overriding story you'll hear about our politics, about our society, is that we've never been more divided. A great schism has apparently opened up, and some people think it's threatening to destroy democracy itself. Many fear that the very future of the United Kingdom is now under threat. Many voters are concerned that the democratic process could be at risk. I alone can fix it. I am your voice. Some people blame the filter bubble and big tech and the ways that nefarious actors are using them to manipulate us. Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica. Analytica. Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica scandal. Others say it's all about economic anxiety and inequality. The anti-poverty charity Oxfam says the UK is one of the most unequal countries in the developed world. And perhaps there's something deeper going on, something psychological that's bringing about a return to tribalism and wall building. So, you're listening to Polarised, a new podcast from the RSA. We'll be here to try to understand these forces that are driving us further apart. Are they real? What can be done about them? It's presented by me, Ian Leslie, and by Matthew Taylor. The podcast isn't about orchestrating an argument between people with opposing views. There's plenty of places where you can hear that, but it's about trying to understand the polarising political moment that we're living through right now.